rapamycin, and Easter Island. The connection between these two is an international tale with plot twists that reads like fiction. You, you can't make this stuff up. This week, we're talking about rapamycin, a drug that was formerly used as an immunosuppressant and as an anti-cancer drug, but that's now being used to extend lifespans and health spans. We'll start out by going over its history, which is pretty darn interesting. Then we'll move on to a discussion about some studies that I've recently read that might be changing my mind with regard to taking rapamycin. And finally, we'll be taking a look at my biggest concern with rapamycin, which is the role that it plays with sarcopenia. The story of rapamycin and the discovery of the mTOR pathway is both interesting and convoluted. It began in 1964 with a scientific expedition to Easter Island. Inhabitants of Easter Island tended to walk around barefoot a lot, yet they didn't get tetanus, which was pretty common in other similar environments, especially ones with a lot of horses. Now, this aroused the curiosity of this researcher named Georges Nogrady, and he figured that the answer was probably in the soil. So he joined an expedition of 40 Canadian scientists going to Easter Island to study the islanders before the Chilean government disrupted their isolation by building a new airstrip. He divided the island into 67 parcels and he collected soil samples from each. Now, he was only able to detect tetanus spores in a single sample, so he packed away his samples and donated them to a research lab in Montreal owned by A. Yerst Pharmaceutical. After researchers isolated microorganisms from the soil, coaxed them to grow, and were able to screen the brew of chemicals that they produced, they found that one of the bacteria produced a compound that could kill fungi. They called it rapamycin, after Rapa Nui, the name given to Easter Island by the Polynesian Islanders that lived there. And they considered it an antifungal. But they discovered that it could also keep cells from multiplying. So they sent samples to the U.S. National Cancer Institute for screening. And the NCI found that it had an incredible activity against solid tumors. So it turned out that rapamycin was also a potent anti-cancer drug. But then in 1982, Ayers decided to close its Montreal research lab and all work on rapamycin came to a halt. But before the lab was closed, a microbiologist named Surin Segal decided to do a large-scale fermentation of the bacterium, pack it up, and take it home, where he stored it in his freezer next to the ice cream in a package labeled, Do Not Eat. And there it stayed for the next five years. The Segal family moved to Princeton, and in 1987, Ayers merged with Wyeth, another pharmaceutical firm. Seagal was able to convince upper management to reopen investigations into rapamycin. And that's when it was discovered that rapamycin could suppress the immune system and prevent the rejection of transplanted organs. So rapamycin added immunosuppressant to its growing list of therapeutic effects. Eventually, other scientists were trying to identify and understand the biological function and biochemical mechanism of its target the protein that responded to rapamycin. It took years for scientists to understand that this target acts as a central hub of the nutrient signaling pathway. This target was named mTOR, for mechanistic target of rapamycin. And that's how mTOR and the mTOR pathway was discovered. In the mid-2000s, researchers were investigating the effects of manipulating genes in the mTOR pathway. And they discovered that dialing back mTOR's activity extended the lifespans of yeast, nematode worms, and fruit flies. Now, they knew that rapamycin could inhibit the mTOR pathway, so they were curious to see what happened if they fed rapamycin to mice. They wanted to perform the experiment on eight-month-old mice, waiting until they were mature before starting the experiment. But it took them a while before they could figure out how to formulate the drug so that it could be put into the mouse food. By the time they figured it out, the mice were 20 months old, but they decided to go ahead and see what would happen if they fed these older mice rapamycin. The results were groundbreaking, and this study made the history books. 
Male mice lived an extra six months, about 9% longer than the control mice. And female mice did even better, living 14% longer. Other researchers performed similar experiments on dogs and marmosets, small primates that have similar risks for chronic diseases as humans. Rapamycin extended lifespans in every animal that they tested it on. And so rapamycin added longevity drug to its now impressive list of beneficial effects. I've always been somewhat skeptical about rapamycin, and I've always felt that there are better ways of suppressing the mTOR pathway, which is one of the primary strategies to slow the aging process. Now, I've talked about that in an earlier video, which you can access right here. But recently, I've been digging around in the research regarding rapamycin, and I found some information that just might make me rethink my position. Now, the mTOR pathway is super complex, and it responds to nutrients found in our diet, in the foods that we eat. And it responds primarily to amino acids. The mTOR pathway is anabolic, and its activation is required for cellular growth. Rapamycin inhibits the mTOR pathway. And this is important because once the mTOR pathway is inhibited, it allows for activation of the AMPK pathway, which is responsible for cellular repair and for autophagy, which is the recycling of cellular components. The AMPK pathway and the mTOR pathway are antagonistic. When one is switched on, the other is switched off. So balancing the mTOR pathway and the AMPK pathway is critical in extending health spans. Now, I've talked about this before, and if you watch those videos, then you'll know that while I'm a fan of occasionally inhibiting the mTOR pathway, I've never been a fan of using rapamycin to do it. I've always felt that there are better ways to accomplish that. For one thing, rapamycin is a universal mTOR inhibitor, meaning that it shuts down the mTOR pathway across all tissue types. Now, I've always felt that there are other better ways to control the mTOR pathway. It also has a long half-life, the period of time that it takes your body to clear out half of the drug, and that's between 62 and 82 hours. But I've recently read several articles and studies that might be changing my stance on rapamycin. There was this paper in which the author cites several reasons why he thinks that rapamycin should absolutely be taken as an anti-aging drug. While he didn't win me over completely, he did make some good points. He claims that rapamycin has gotten a bad rap and that there have been a number of bad side effects that have been attributed to rapamycin that are simply not true. One was a risk of cancer. And he talks about rapamycin's proven anti-cancer properties and how it's been demonstrated to prevent cancer, not cause it. He talks about its metabolic effect and how safe it is. He talks about how rapamycin extends lifespan even if started late in life, unlike some other longevity interventions like calorie restriction, which has proven somewhat ineffective if started once you're already old. Then there's this paper, which takes a look at a variety of drugs that might have the ability to slow the aging process. Now, this paper refers us to all the studies that have been conducted on longevity that have used rapamycin to extend lifespans. It talks about just how many there have been, about how they've been conducted on a large variety of different species, like yeast, worms, fruit flies, mice, dogs, and marmosets, and how rapamycin has extended lifespans in every single study. It talks about the dog study, in which researchers saw improved left ventricle systolic and diastolic function, just like they saw in the mouse studies, and that there's a new dog study underway to test cognitive and heart functions, immunity, and incidence of cancer. It talks about the marmoset study, which was the first study done on primates. Now, the study looks at a lot of drugs, and it compares them in their ability to positively impact any of the nine hallmarks of aging. And rapamycin comes out on top, having a positive impact on six of the nine hallmarks. It's the only one that impacts so many, and it does quite a bit better than most of the other drugs. Now, there's a new study that I don't believe is launched yet called the PEARL study. It stands for Participatory Evaluation of Aging with Rapamycin for a Longevity Study. Now, this is sort of a grassroots volunteer study that's a bit different. It's crowdfunded and crowdsourced. 
They'll be taking 200 participants who are between the ages of 50 and 85 years of age, and they'll follow them over the course of a year, taking measurements at the beginning, at six months, and at 12 months. They'll be dividing them into four groups plus a control group, and they'll be giving them different dosing regimens. This is the first study to see if rapamycin extends lifespans on humans as well as it does on mice. Immunosuppression is an age-related problem for the elderly. They have a decline in naive lymphocytes. They have a reduced response to vaccines and they're prone to increased infections, all signs of a declining immune system. Now, this same paper talked about how elderly mice showed a similar lower response to vaccines and how mice treated with rapamycin showed an increased level of naive lymphocytes and a boosted response to vaccines. It also referred to a study in humans that showed an improved immune response after six weeks of treatment. And this study on the use of rapalogs, drugs that are similar to rapamycin, to treat COVID seems to back up the claim that these drugs can actually improve immunity. Now, in a previous video, I talked about how important the mTOR pathway is to the immune system and how rapamycin suppresses immunity. That's because I bought into the belief that rapamycin is an immunosuppressant, which is how it was originally labeled by the FDA. But it's not an immunosuppressant. It's actually an immunomodulator. These are compounds that can help support immune function by modifying, generally in a beneficial way, the immune system's response to a threat. And it's this mislabeling of rapamycin as an immunosuppressant that is primarily responsible for rapamycin's bad rap. So one of the big reasons that I was down on rapamycin was because I'm concerned about sarcopenia. So I exercise a lot to prevent that. Because the mTOR pathway is so important to building muscle, taking rapamycin to shut down the mTOR pathway seemed counterproductive. But this paper seems to contradict that thinking. It states that mTOR1 activity has long been known to be induced in aging muscle. The mTORC pathway has two complexes, mTORC complex 1 or mTORC1 and mTORC2. Chronic activation of mTORC1 stimulates progressive muscle damage and loss. In one study, they found that when mTORC1 was activated in certain mice, it produced enlarged muscle fibers at around two months of age. But as these mice grew older, they found that this beneficial effect morphed into muscle fiber damage at around six to nine months of age, eventually resulting in a 50% loss of muscle mass by the age of 18 months. And this was accompanied by a reduced survival rate. What they then found was that by inhibiting the mTOR pathway with rapamycin, they were able to prevent this age-related loss of muscle. Inhibiting mTORC1 protected the aging muscle from atrophy. It reduced the apoptosis that was associated with reduced muscle fiber in aging skeletal muscles. And in another study, they found that inhibiting mTORC1 with rapamycin preserved both fiber size and muscle weight. I think that the key here is chronic activation of mTORC1. Let's take a look at AKT-dependent activation of mTORC1. As near as I can tell, AKT-dependent activation means activation that is a result of some form of stress. The AKT signaling pathway promotes survival and growth in response to extracellular signals. So I think that AKT dependent activation means that mTORC1 gets activated as a result of this type of signaling. And I think that a weight training session might be an example of this. AKT dependent activation of mTORC1 is beneficial and it prevents muscular atrophy. However, AKT independent activation of mTORC1. In other words, activation of mTORC1 that does not depend on the AKT signaling pathway is detrimental to muscle tissue and it triggers protein degradation and muscular atrophy. Now, I believe that this is the form of activation that can become chronic later in life and that's so bad. I also believe that this is the form of activation that is prevented by shutting down mTORC1 with rapamycin. Now, I could be wrong about all of this. And if any of you guys have any information on this, let me know in the comments. So 
What does all this mean? How does it affect my stance on taking rapamycin to inhibit the mTOR pathway? I think that I'm becoming convinced that taking rapamycin might not be a bad idea, but I would still need to figure out dosing and scheduling. There's a number of studies that indicate that taking rapamycin later in life is still a good thing and that there are plenty of benefits that can still be obtained. They also show that its benefits remain even if you're taking it transitionally, meaning if you cycle it. The PEARL study is testing several different dosing regimens. They're testing 2.5 milligrams taken three times a week, 5 milligrams taken once a week, 5 milligrams taken twice a week, and 10 milligrams taken once a week. Now, I'll be really interested in finding out how this study wraps up and what they conclude from it, particularly about dosing. And then there's the cost. Rapamycin ain't cheap. Depending on which dose you might choose to go with, it would cost somewhere between $100 and $200 a month. And that's from GoodRx. And that's if you can get it. Rapamycin is a prescription drug and using it as a longevity intervention would be an off-label use. So I think that most doctors would probably be unwilling to prescribe it. So even though it's probably not in my best interest, I think for now I'm probably going to continue to not take it. If any of you guys are taking rapamycin, let us know in the comments. Tell us your experience and tell us where you obtained it. I think we'd all like to know. Hope you guys enjoyed this video. Check out this playlist for more information on the mTOR pathway and balancing it with the AMPK pathway. That's it for me. I'm out of here. Catch you next week.